Even today, in our modern world, the abilities of women to lead are always faced with doubts, with questions, with suspicions. But this was not always the case, at least not in Southeast Asia. So can women really rule? Let's find out. Mabuhay or in kapampangan, luwid kayo. Welcome back to my channel. It's me, Kirby Aralio, your friendly Pinoy historian. And if you are new to my channel, in this channel, I make videos about our people's history, culture, and everything in between. So if you like any of those things, don't forget to like, share this video, comment down below, and please, please subscribe. And in today's video, we'll be learning more about the many amazing women who ruled over the golden age of what is now Southeast Asia. But before we begin, here are some few reminders. Making videos like this takes a lot of time, research, and resources. So if you want to support my channel and my research, please consider being my patron on Patreon or a member of my channel here on YouTube. Or you can also support me by getting copies of any of my books, coloring books, and ebooks. So check them out on my website in the links down below. In fact, to expand your knowledge about today's topic, check out my new book and coloring book on the fierce women of early Southeast Asia, where you can learn more and meet over three dozen inspiring women from the histories and the oral traditions of our ancestors. So don't miss out out and order your copies today. I also want to give a special shout out to Yan Mirasol, aka Sining Nisid. Dakala salamat for working with me to create these amazing illustrations of my own ancestors featured in my new book. So check out Sining Nisid's amazing artwork in the links down below. Now today's topic is just an introduction to the golden ages of Southeast Asian queens. And as much as I would love to, a single YouTube video is simply not enough to cover everything. But I do hope that this video will help inspire you to dig deeper, to learn more and do something productive with that knowledge to make our world a better place. So without further ado, let's begin. Let's meet our queens. So first, let's start with some context. Today, in the early 21st century, female leadership is making progress on the global stage, with heads of states such as the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, and the long-serving Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, earning widespread appreciation for their leadership skills, especially during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. But this has not always been the case. For many centuries, female leadership was seen as something to be avoided by many societies. It was an unwelcome development which could only occur when all legitimate male heirs had died. And this was the case in Tudor England where Queen Mary I and Queen Elizabeth I only became rulers after their much younger brother Edward had been given his chance when he was just 9 years old. And in other parts of Europe like in the Kingdom of France, it was simply considered impossible for a queen to rule. Southeast Asia then in the period between the 1st and the 18th centuries was something of an unusual case. Because in many parts of the region during this long period, female rule was not just allowed but it was often preferred. And today, we'll explore some of the primary examples of this phenomenon. And a good starting point in today's topic is the Sultanate of Patani, located on the northeastern side of the Malay Peninsula. The Sultanate emerged in the late 14th and 15th centuries, and it grew gradually to incorporate the modern-day provinces of Thailand called Patani, Yala, and Naratiwat, and also a section of northern Malaysia. Patani reached its peak during the 1500s and the 1600s, when the Sultanate was ruled almost exclusively exclusively by women. Between 1584 and 1711, the Sultanate was ruled by seven queens, and the emergence of female rule in Patani is connected with the wider history of the Sultanate in the 16th century. During this period, Patani's influence was expanding. Following the Portuguese conquest and capture of Malacca in 1511, Patani became a major trading hub in the Gulf of Thailand. With the Europeans encroaching on the other side of the Malay Peninsula, the Chinese and Japanese and other Asians began shifting their trade to Patani, and as a result, the city grew to become a large, bustling center of approximately 45,000 people. However, despite its growth, Patani was riven by internal political instability in the mid-1500s, with many male heirs being murdered. Palace intrigue in Patani was not just chaotic but also very bloody, and this only finally came to an end around the year 1584 when Raja Ijao, meaning the Green Queen, ascended to the throne after all the other legitimate male heirs had died or had been killed. 
she was the first of Patani's long line of female rulers. And although she faced opposition to begin with, her long reign from 1584 to 1616 eventually proved to be extremely successful. In fact, European observers of her court reported how much she was loved and highly regarded by her people. Moreover, this occurred at a time when Patani was enjoying a period of increased economic growth. And as her people benefited from the stability of her reign and the growing wealth of Patani, they began to favor female leadership, which contrasted so sharply with the bloody anarchy before the accession of Raja Ijao. The prevalence of female rule within the Sultanate of Patani for a period of nearly a century and a half remains one of the longest recorded periods of female rule of any state in world history. Patani may seem like the most extreme case of a Southeast Asian kingdom or state being ruled by women during the pre-colonial and early modern period. But many other kingdoms and sultanates across the region also had their own female rulers. And this was especially true across the East Indies, or what are now Indonesia, the Philippines, and the Malay Peninsula, though less so further north in Siam, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. For instance, the Muslim port of Pasai in the bustling streets of Malacca had two queens in quick succession between 1405 and 1434. In Burma, Queen Shin Sabu ruled for two decades, between 1453 and 1472. Also in what is now Burma or Myanmar, we have Manisanda, the Mon princess who later became the queen of the kingdom of Bagan. Together with her one true love and third husband, King Kensita, their empire ushered in an era of peace and prosperity between the different ethnicities. Jepara, on the northern coast of the island of Java, was ruled by Ratu Kalinyamat from around 1549 to 1579. Moreover, the reigns of these queens, like that of the successive queens of Patani, were often the points at which their kingdoms reached their greatest power. For instance, during the period of female rule at Pasai in the early 1400s, the port was the foremost trading center in the Straits of Malacca, and this was before it was taken over by Malacca later in the century. On the other hand, Ratu Kalinyamat turned Jepara into an important trading and political center, and she conducted several military campaigns against the Portuguese at Malacca in the 1500s, and more on this in a future video. And early on, on the island of Java, the great Majapahit Empire was once effectively ruled by at least two queens, the mother and daughter Gayatri Najapatni and Jagitarja, also known as Tribuana Wijayatunga Dewi. Although never becoming a queen regnant herself, Gayatri Najapatni's influence over the politics of the empire transcended from the reign of her husband, the founder of the empire Raden Vijaya, to those of his children, her stepson, Jaya Negara, and her own daughter, Jagitarja. As the beloved matriarch of the Singhasari and Majapahit Rajasa dynasty, Gayatri Najapatni provided her empire with stability in times of chaos, earning her the love and the trust of her people. And after her death, she was enshrined as the Bodhisattva Prajna Paramita, which means the perfection of wisdom. And her daughter Jagitarja would be the first queen regnant of the Majapahit Empire, succeeding the chaotic and notorious reign of her own half-brother Jayanegara. Jagitarja, also known as Tribuana with Jayatunga Dewi, is best remembered to be the greatest empress of one of the greatest empires in the history of Southeast Asia. Her two-decade rule expanded their dominions and laid the foundations for the empire's golden age. She was succeeded by her son, the famous Hayamuruk, and similar to her mother, after Tribuana. On Gadewi's death, she was deified as Parvati, the Hindu goddess of harmony, power, nourishment, devotion, motherhood, and fertility. On our next video in this special Southeast Asian Women series, we'll learn more and meet the many fearless women warriors in the history of Southeast Asia from the oral traditions of our diverse people. Like, for example, the Trunk Scissors of Vietnam, the legendary Urduha of Northern Philippines, the warrior queen Chesiti Wan Kembang of Malaysia, the fierce admiral Malahayati of Aceh, Indonesia, and many, many more. So please stay tuned for that video in the coming weeks. But for now, let's get back to our Golden Age queens. There are other countless examples of female rulers across Southeast Asia before colonialism, and the pattern is too acute not to suspect that female rule came to be seen as preferable throughout the region, at least in certain contexts. It seems that female rule was viewed as a way of establishing peace and stability if a state had gone through a period of dire crisis and instability, like what happened in Patani prior to the succession of Raja Ijao, or a period of tyrannical male rule such as in the Sultan 
Sultanate of Aceh, a kingdom which mirrors Patani in its long period of female rulers. This Sultanate emerged on the western end of the island of Sumatra as an important trading port guarding the entry point from the Bay of Bengal into the Straits of Malacca and therefore guarding the entry point to Southeast Asia. In the early 1600s, the Sultanate of Aceh expanded considerably under the rule of Sultan Iskandar Muda, who reigned from 1607 to 1636. While his reign was successful in many respects, it was also highly autocratic and tyrannical and he sought to monopolize trade with the Europeans at the expense of the local merchant community. And thus when he died in 1636, the people of Aceh were anxious for a change. And after the brief rule of his son-in-law, Sultan Iskandar Tani, from 1636 to 1641, it was Iskandar Muda's own daughter, Taj Ulalam, Safiya Tudin Shah, who was chosen to become Sultana. And her reign was long and lasted until 1675. And she brought much needed stability to Aceh and the resumption of good relations between the merchants, the aristocracy, and the royal palace. And as a result of her successful reign, like in Patani, female rule was adopted as the norm in Aceh. And Sultana Tajulalam Safiya Tudin Shah was succeeded by three queens down to the end of the 17th century. And elsewhere across the Malay Peninsula, there are also many instances of women not ruling officially but holding extensive power behind the scenes at the court of a king or a sultan who was deemed to be a poor ruler himself. What is also striking is that wherever native Austronesian societies held sway, the pattern of female rule was even more pronounced. Historically speaking, the diverse indigenous Austronesian peoples have been more inclined than any other ethnic group anywhere in the world to place women on the throne. For instance, in South Sulawesi, in what is now Indonesia, there have been 105 queens regnant that we know of. And this is because the indigenous Bugis people of Sulawesi have a tradition of regarding women of noble descent as suitable and worthy rulers, even when there are male candidates. And this was a rarity in almost all pre-modern societies, especially in the West. Similarly, in the islands we now call the Philippines, women occupied many esteemed positions in both political and religious life. And the foremost example of a female ruler in these islands was my own direct ancestor, the great Kalangitan of Luzon, popularly known today as Dayang Kalangitan. She was the queen regnant of the kingdoms of Tondo and Namayan, who also succeeded her father as the Lakan and paramount ruler of Luzon. What is often referred to as the Kingdom of Luzon was actually a collection of principalities, city-states, and petty kingdoms, somewhat similar to the political setup of the Holy Roman Empire. And her reign as the Lacan or the paramount ruler, the Queen of Luzon, Kalangitan, ushered in the Golden Age of Luzon during a very long reign, which is believed to be from around the mid-1400s down to roughly the early 1500s. And following in Kalangitan's footsteps were her own daughter, Pangidwan, and her daughter daughter-in-law is Meria. Panginwan, Kalangitan's eldest child, would rule the kingdoms of Taal and Balayan equally alongside her husband, Prince Balagtas, a prince from Luzon and the Majapahit Empire. Is Meria of Sulu and Brunei on the other hand co-founded the kingdom and the city-state of Manila. She co-founded Manila with her husband, Kalangitan's second child and firstborn son, Raja Salalila, the king of Luzon after Kalangitan. And upon his death, Is Meria succeeded her husband husband as Raja of Manila, and her rule as Raja of Manila was marked by her wisdom to maintain peace and harmony in Luzon. And she reigned as Raja of Manila until her son, Raja Ache, was ready to ascend the throne to become Raja Matanda, the king of Luzon. And from the reign of Kalangitan in the early 1400s to those of her grandchildren in the late 1500s, Luzon secured the much coveted monopoly of trade with China, and it became a major player in the pre-colonial geopolitics and the economy of Southeast Asia. And this is known today as the pre-colonial Golden Age of Luzon. Also noteworthy was Ismeria's own mother, Putri Leila Menchalai, the legendary princess of Sulu and later queen of Brunei. She also reigned over the Golden Age of the Sultanates of Brunei and Sulu in the late 1400s to the early 1500s, alongside her beloved husband, Sultan Bolkia of Brunei. And across the Sea of Champa, in what are now Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos, being a 
queen regnant may not seem to be the norm. But the early kingdoms in this part of Southeast Asia also had their own share of benevolent queens. According to oral traditions, the kingdom of Champa, which had once dominated the region we now call Southeast Asia, was founded by a queen, Poi Nanagar. According to historical records, the kingdom of Champa was founded after breaking free from the Chinese Empire sometime around the year 192. Today, Poi Nanagar is revered as the mother goddess in countries like Vietnam and Cambodia. And speaking of Cambodia, in the fabled Kamai Empire of Angkor, two sisters from the 1100s set the standards of a progressive society, a society that was far advanced than their European counterparts. Jayaraja Devi and Indra Devi, the first and second wives of Jayavarman VII respectively, built countless temples, hospitals, and schools. They made sure that education was accessible to all, regardless of gender. In fact, Indra Devi herself also served as a professor and the administrator of at least three colleges dedicated to women. And when Jayaraja Devi died early on in Jayavarman VII's reign, Indra Devi took on the reins and she continued her elder sister's social programs such as the universal right to education, property ownership, political power, and public health care. It is also believed that the first monarch of the Kamai Empire and the Kamai people was Queen Soma, who ruled what is now Cambodia sometime around the year 68. Unfortunately, not all ruling queens from the history of Southeast Asia were beloved, were revered or celebrated. Some queens were later on condemned and remembered differently in history. Some of them, despite their accomplishments, were vilified. On the island, the beautiful island paradise of Bali, a queen reigned over a period of stability and prosperity. Her name was Mahendradatta, but sadly, later accounts recorded her as a witch, an evil queen who practiced black magic. In fact, after her death in the year 1011, she was deified and depicted as Durga, the goddess of war. Her son, Airlanga, however, would become one of the greatest and most celebrated rulers in the history and the oral tradition of what is now Indonesia. And back on the mainland, in what is now the country of Laos, the kingdom of Lansang was ruled by a queen during a chaotic and bloody period of the mid-1400s. And her regnal name was Mahadevi, and it means the great goddess. But despite seemingly trying her best to maintain stability in a period that saw the murder of seven successive kings, Mahadevi would be vilified in later chronicles. She was later given the epithet Nankyo Pimpia, which literally means the cruel, and despite the lack of irrefutable evidence, she was blamed for the death of the seven kings. Now again, these are just a few examples of the many queens who reigned over the various golden ages of what is now Southeast Asia. And as I've mentioned before, if Europe had its own Victoria and Elizabeth I of the United Kingdom, or Isabella of Spain, or Maria Theresa of Austria, or Catherine the Great of Russia, in Southeast Asia there is just too many examples to mention in a single video. Overall, historically speaking, Southeast Asia between the 1st and the 18th centuries remains one of the few regions of the world where female rule was the strongest in history. Only a few other places at specific times can equal this record. Most notably, what are now Madagascar and East Timor in the 19th century or the 1800s, where female rule became the norm. In fact, now that I think about it, it is also important to note that the indigenous peoples of Madagascar and East Timor Timor also belonged to the Austronesian family, and they were also part of the greater world of the early Southeast Asians. And thus, Southeast Asia in the pre-colonial and early modern period represents a time and a place when female rule flourished in a remarkable fashion. And this video is just a glimpse into the fascinating golden ages of our ancestors. So if you want to dig deeper and learn more about these amazing women and see dozens more examples of these fierce queens, check out my new book and coloring book on the fierce women of early Southeast Asia. Visit my website to order your copies today. And that is it for me today. So let me know in the comments below which one of these queens are your favorites. Also let me know in the comments below which one of them you would like me to feature in their own separate videos. Actually, I already have a few of them in mind like the sisters, the Kamai sisters, Jayaraj Devi and Indra Devi. So stay tuned for that video in the coming weeks. And if you like this video or learn a thing or two, don't forget to like, share this video, comment down below, and please, please subscribe. Help me grow my channel so more people can learn more about our people's diverse history, culture, and everything in between.
But of course, before we go, today's shoutout goes to Dalang Dayang City Jalia to Rabin Hataman, the Honorable Mayor of Isabella de Basilan in the Philippines. Shout out to my dear friend, my dear ka my friend Narvi from Stockton, California. Shout out to Mazio Hada from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Anisa Putriani from Indonesia. Shout out to Sarai from Thailand, Sunya from Laos, and Lin from Vietnam. And of course, special thanks and special shout out to my patron and my dear friend, April Del Mundo. You know, this video will not be possible without the love and the support of all my patrons through the years. Kaya naman, maraming maraming salamat po. Magsukul tuud kay mo. Daghang salamat, dakalpong salamat. Or in kamay, or kontram, in tai, kapan krab. And in Bahasa Melayu, terima kasih. See you next time or in Tagalog Kita Kits and in Kapampangan. Miki Takes and in Bahasa Melayu Jumpa lagi